Hey guys, this is the video for chapter two, which is over differentiation, the language of change. All right, so whatever uh, you want to call it there, um, fancy words and all. Differentiation. Um, I'm assuming you guys are comfortable with this pretty much already, and you're just watching this video as a refresher because we've already covered this um, many months ago. Uh, anyway, let's move on. So 2.1, it's over the derivative and two interpretations of that derivative. Uh, we'll also talk about some important derivative notation. Um, so we'll start with the definition of the derivative, the limit definition of the derivative, as we'll call it. Uh, and then we'll go into the rules of differentiation, uh, all of our shortcuts and things like that. And we'll talk about marginal change, which will be a reoccurring theme throughout all the rest of the following chapters. So the definition of the derivative, we say the derivative of f of x, denoted by f prime of x, is given by the limit as h goes to 0 of the difference quotient, provided that that limit exists, right? If that limit doesn't exist, then we say f is not differentiable at whatever x value you're looking at. Um, and if it does exist, we say it is differentiable at x. Uh, and this idea of differentiation looking at the derivative of a function tells us how a function is changing. Uh, one thing to note is that this limit should look familiar if you just finished chapter one, because that's exactly what we called the instantaneous rate of change of f of x, right? And in fact, the derivative is one interpretation of it, is the instantaneous rate of change. So it's the limit as h goes to zero of the difference quotient. So our two interpretations, I already gave away one. It's the derivative is the instantaneous rate of change of your function. It's also the slope of the tangent line, right, at, at whatever x value you are looking at. Um, so two interpretations. It gives you the instantaneous rate of change, and that is the same thing as the slope of the tangent line at whatever x value. So those are our two interpretations for the derivative of f of x. So we're going to need some notation for this. So let's say f of x equals y, and that would be some expression of x, whatever. Um, and these are all equivalent ways uh, to denote the derivative, right? So common way would be over here of f prime of x or y prime. It was introduced by Lagrange in 1700, uh, 1770. And if you uh, are... Reviewing this video after you've watched the chapter 7 ones, that name Lagrange should sound familiar. Yes, it is the same guy. Um, anyway, uh, if you're watching this before the chapter 7 stuff, you'll get what I mean later. Uh, anyway, uh, we also have this df or dy dx notation that was introduced by a guy named Leibniz in 1684. He was one of the uh, co-inventors of calculus along with Isaac Newton. Um, and you can also just stick the f or y out in front, and this would say take the derivative with respect to x of f, right? So something like that. Uh, anyway, so those are all equivalent notations. Like I said, this is probably the one we'll see most common, uh, and then second most, and then probably... Okay, so now if we want to talk about the derivative, not just as an, a function itself of x, but talk about it at a specific x value, this is how we say to plug things in. So here we would say f prime of a, plug in a, or y prime, and then this bar means evaluate when x equals a, so that means to plug in x equals a, and then here is the other way we would say that again, this big bar means evaluate. Um, We'll see that again when we get to integrals, right? So if you're watching this video as a review, it's that same bar means evaluate. Okay, so here, find and interpret the derivative of f of x equals 3x minus 2. So remember, the derivative, f prime of x, is given by the limit as h goes to 0 of the difference quotient. So that would be the limit as h goes to 0. Just rewriting that of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. Now remember when we were doing these uh, instantaneous rate of change problems, we said that in the numerator, everything that does not have an h should always cancel. 
right? And that's still true because this is the same thing. Uh, and then once we are left with only things that have H's in the numerator, we can factor an H out and cancel it. Um, so we just we need to remember that that's uh, what we would expect to happen. Okay, don't forget uh, this limit as H goes to zero, you have to rewrite that every time until you actually evaluate that limit, plug in H equals zero, right? If you still have an H over here, and this stuff, then you need to still have this here because you've not taken that limit yet. All right, so what is f of x plus h? So instead of an x, we plug in x plus h, and we get 3 times x plus h in parentheses minus 2. That's f of x plus h. And then we'll subtract the original f of x, which would be 3x minus 2. And I like to put big parentheses around both of those guys, um, mainly to help me remember to distribute this negative sign. Uh, when it comes time to do that. Uh, this whole thing is going to be over h. So let's distribute that negative sign. What do we get? We haven't taken the limit yet. We have not plugged in h equals 0. So we keep writing the limit as h equals uh, as h goes to 0. And that's why uh, what allows us to say equals to. If we say that it's equal and don't write that limit, that's not true. It's not equal to uh, what we're writing. You have to have the limit there uh, for those things to be equal. All right, so let's first, uh, we can distribute this 3. So we get 3x plus 3h minus 2. And then here we'll get minus 3x, and then the negative will cancel with the negative and get plus 2. So minus 3x plus 2 over h. That's a 2 here. And now notice we have a positive 3x and a negative 3x, a minus 2 and a plus 2. So those canceled, and we were left with the limit as h goes to 0 of 3h. That's the only thing left in the top. And what uh, tells you maybe you're on the right track is that it has an h in it. If you had anything in that numerator that didn't cancel and did not have an h in it, then you made a mistake somewhere. So the only thing that was left was something with an h. Uh, you can have more than one thing with an h. That's fine. But certainly everything in that numerator needs to have an h in there. Uh, now once we get to this guy, we can cancel these h's, and we're left with the limit as h goes to 0 of 3. Well, 3 doesn't change because there's no h's in there, so that's just 3. So that is the derivative. f prime of x is 3. Oops, x is 3. We also need to interpret that, so f prime of x is 3. So for the interpret, I'm not going to write it down, um, but that would mean, well, remember, we have two interpretations. That means the instantaneous rate of change is 3 for all x values, because this is constant. It's always 3, no matter what x you plug in. And that means that the slope of the tangent line is also always 3, no matter what x value you are looking at. This one, find and interpret y prime for y equals 2. So here, we still need to find the limit as h goes to 0 of the difference quotient. Uh, and this is a y, but what if we called that f of x? That might be easier um, to write this difference quotient down, right? So that would be f of x plus h minus f of x over h. All right, so if y equals 2, or if f of x equals 2, plug in x equals, instead of an x, x plus h. Well, there's no x in here. So no matter what you plug in, you get 2. So x plus h is just 2. And so is f of x. And 2 minus 2 is 0. So this is the limit as h goes to 0 of 0 over h. But 0 over h is just 0. So before we take the limit, we can simplify that to say the limit as h goes to 0 of 0. And now it doesn't matter what h is doing. That's always 0. Right, so here y prime was 0. Right, so there it is. And we can interpret that again two ways. That would say the instantaneous rate of change is 0 for any x value. Or the slope of the tangent line is 0 for any x value. So those are two good interpretations there. All right, so now we want to find and interpret here df dx. So this is uh, the other notation for f prime, the derivative. Um, 
and this would be f prime of 1, right? That's equivalent notation there. And this is our f of x here. So to find that derivative df dx, we take the limit as h goes to 0 of the difference quotient, f of x plus h, minus f of x over h. Uh, as a quick side note, assuming that a lot of you guys are watching this video as a review, um, coming back after, you know, chapter 7 stuff, uh, if I don't say use the limit definition of derivative, you do not have to use the limit definition of the derivative, right? But there will be, for sure, a problem on your final exam where you are asked to do that. Um, so that's why we are going to review that here. Okay, so uh, maybe in... In the final, it would say something like, use the limit definition of derivative to, f to find f prime. Okay, whatever. Uh, so that's what we want to do. So that's the limit as h goes to 0. And what is f of x plus h? Well, that's 2 times x plus h squared minus 4 times x plus h plus 1. So we plugged in x plus h instead of x. And then we're going to subtract. And here's where those parentheses will be helpful to remember to distribute that negative sign. And f of x is just what we see there, 2x squared minus 4x plus 1. And that's all over h. Okay, so now we need to simplify. So we have 2 times x plus h squared. All right, so first actually, we need to make sure we don't forget to keep writing that limit as h goes to 0. Uh, so 2 times x plus h squared. So let's leave the 2 and let's expand x plus h squared to get x squared Oops. plus 2xh plus h squared minus, and then we can distribute this 4, and don't forget that it's really a negative 4, so that would be minus 4x minus 4h plus 1 and then distribute this negative here and you get minus 2x squared plus 4x minus 1 and that's all over h alright now let's distribute this 2 over here so this would uh, become what? I'm, I don't want to rewrite this, so I'm just going to erase some things. So if we were to drop those parentheses, we'd, we'd get a 2x squared. So that 2x squared. And then it was 2 times 2xh, so that would be 4xh. And then the 2 times h squared would be 2h squared. And I'm going to squeeze that in there. Okay, so that's distributing that 2. And now, notice that we have a positive 2x squared and a negative 2x squared. Those cancel. We have a negative 4x and a positive 4x. Those cancel. And we've got a positive 1 and a negative 1, and those cancel. And that's the only stuff that cancels. Let's see what we're left with. And remember that we should expect everything we're left with to have an h in it. So we have the limit as h goes to 0 of 4xh plus 2h squared. So that's all, oh, whoops, minus 4h. That's all that was left. And notice that all of that does have an h in it. So that's good. Uh, that's all over h. So now that everything in that numerator uh, has been canceled, we're only left with stuff that has an h in it, we're going to factor an h out. When we do that, we're left with 4x, right? So this h came out here. Here we'll pull one of these h's out, and we'll be left with plus 2, and there's still another h left. And then we'll pull this h out, and we'll get minus 4. That's all over h. And now once we factor that h out, we can cancel it, and we get the limit as h goes to 0 of 4x plus 2h minus 4. All right, now we are going to evaluate that limit. So plugging in h equals 0, 4x is just 4x. 2h would be 0, so that's going to go away. 
and minus 4 is also left over. So that is our derivative, f prime of x, or df dx. Uh, so to interpret that, it will be the same interpretation as before. That's going to give us the instantaneous rate of change at x, or the slope of the tangent line at x. We're also asked to plug in 1. So what is f prime, or df dx, plug in 1? Well, it looks like you get 4. Plug in 1 would be 4 times 1 minus 4. That's 4 minus 4, which is 0. So f prime of 1 is 0. So that means that... Okay, so now um, th that's our limit definition of the derivative. If you're told use the limit definition of the derivative, that's what you would do, something along those lines. Um, we're also uh, going to identify here some uh, rules for derivatives that we would just use in it. if we needed to take a derivative. We're just going to use these rules. Um, so the first rule is that the derivative of a constant uh, if f of x is a constant, then the derivative is 0. So for example, if f of x is uh, 2,024,587 or any other number, then f prime of x is 0. So the derivative of a constant is 0. And another rule is called the simple, simple power rule. So that says if f of x is x to the n, where here n is any number, uh, then what do we get? Well, to take the derivative, you pull the exponent down to the front, and you get that n out in the front, and then you reduce your exponent by 1. So as an example, what is the derivative of f of x equals x? Well, remember, x is x to the 1. So f of x, you would pull down that 1, and you get 1 times x to the 1 minus 1. And 1 minus 1 is 0, so that would be 1 times x to the 0, which would just be 1. All right? And so uh, uh, that, that's the rule you would use anytime you're taking the derivative of something like x to a number. All right, how about... Uh, find y prime, plug in x equals negative 1 if y is x to the fifth. So first we'll have to find y prime. All right, so we'll pull that 5 down. We get 5x to the 5 minus 1. So that would be 5, oops, that's an equal sign there, equals 5x to the 4. So that's y prime. And then y prime plug in x equals negative 1 would be 5 times negative 1 to the 4. Negative 1 to the 4 is just 1, so that's 5. All right, so here let's uh, do another example of that. Find df dx, the derivative for f of x is x to the negative 3. Okay, so again, that's x to the something, so we're going to use the power rule there. So we pull the negative 3 out into the front, and we multiply by x to the negative 3 minus 1. So that would be negative 3x to the negative 3 minus 1 is negative 4. So there's df dx. Pull the negative 3 down, reduce the exponent by 1. All right, how about something like find dy dx for y equals the fourth root of x cubed? All right, so you might think, hey, this is not what we've been doing, but uh, it's really just hiding really just hiding in there. So what we need to do is rewrite the fourth root of x cubed as x to the something. So what is the exponent for the fourth root of x cubed? What is the exponent? Well, you have a cubed, so it's going to be a 3 in the top, and then a fourth root becomes over 4. So that's x to the 3 fourths. And now once we see that, hopefully we say, oh, okay, that's x to a number. Uh, I know how to do that. So that would be you pull the 3 fourths down and multiply by x to the 3 fourths minus 1. So that's 3 fourths x to the negative 1. We've got another rule here. So that rule is about the derivative of a constant times a function. So if f is differentiable, which means we can take the derivative of it, and c is any number, then the derivative of c times the function 
is c times the derivative of the function. So that c can slide out in front of the derivative, and there it is hiding. All right, so that just means you can always bring that constant along for the ride when you're taking the derivative, um, and you just take the derivative of whatever was left. So for example, how would you take the derivative of 2 over x squared? All right, so 2 over x squared. Well, what we'd have to do is rewrite that as 2 times x to the, well, if it's an x squared in the bottom, then if we want it in the top, it'll become a negative 2. And this rule says what we'll do is, for the derivative f prime of x, we're going to just bring that 2 along for the ride and then multiply by the derivative of this x to the negative 2. All right, so we bring that 2 along for the ride. The derivative of x to the negative 2 would be where you pull the negative 2 down and you get x to the negative 2 minus 1 is negative 3. All right, so that would be negative 4x to the negative 3. All right, so that 2 out in the front just comes along for the ride. And then you take the derivative of the rest of it and multiply it by that. All right, how about f prime of x for f of x equals 4? All right, so f prime of x, we know that we're going to take the 4. It's just hanging out in the front, so it's just going to keep hanging out in the front, bring it along for the ride. And then we need the derivative of x. Well, remember, we already did that one, and we got that it was 1 times x to the 0, which was just 1. So that means that the derivative is just 4. All right, and in fact, any time you have just any number times x, uh, it doesn't matter that it was a 4, the derivative is just that number, right, because of this rule. That number would just come along for the ride. Now let's look at another rule here. Uh, we've got the sum and difference rule. So if you have two functions, we'll call them f and g, that are differentiable, meaning you can take the derivative of them, then the derivative of f plus g or f minus g is you take the derivative of f and then just add or subtract the derivative of g. So you can just sort of do them term by term. So for example, uh, if you're looking at this function f of x and you want the derivative, well, what this rule means is that you can just take the derivative of this and then add the derivative of this and then subtract the derivative of this and then add the derivative of this. And so you could just do that term by term. So what would the derivative of 1 over x be? Uh, well, 1 over x, you can rewrite as x to the negative 1. So when you take that derivative, you get negative 1 coming down. x to the negative 1 minus 1 is negative 2. So that's the derivative of 1 over x. Plus, and now we've got a 2x cubed, so the 2 comes along for the ride. And then the x cubed, when you take the derivative, you get 3. x to the 3 minus 1 is 2. And then minus... What's the derivative of 9x? Well, that's the one we just did. You know it's going to be 9. And then plus the derivative of a 4, which is a constant. The derivative of a constant is 0. So what did we get here? We've got minus x to the negative 2 plus 2 times 3 is 6x squared minus 9. So there's our derivative f prime of x. 0. And then what can you say about the graph of f of x at the points where f prime of x equals 0? So let's start with finding the x values where f of x is 0. So if f of x is 0, that means 0 is x squared minus 3x plus 2. So this will be practice here of solving a quadratic. And so how do we do that? Well, we want to factor. And this factors to what? Well, it looks like since we have a plus 2 at the end, that'll have to be 2 times 1. And since it's minus 3 in the middle, it'll have to be minus 1 and minus 2. So x minus 1, x minus 2. And that gives us x equals plus 1 and plus 2. All right, you set x minus 1 equal to 0 and x minus 2 equal to 0 to get those two values for x. So that's uh, where f of x equals 0, right? When x is 1 and x is 2. So that means on the graph of f of x, it's going to hit 0 uh, at 1 and 2. So something like this, where this is 1 and this is 2. All right. Uh, what about f prime of x equals 0? Well, to do that, first we need to find f prime of x. 
And what is f prime of x? Well, that's 2x, right? x squared becomes 2x minus 3, right? So 3x becomes 3. So setting that equal to 0, we get 0 is 2x minus 3. And then add 3 and divide by 2, and you get 3 halves equals x. So that first derivative is 0, 3 halves, which is 1 and a half right here. So something like that. So what can you say about the graph? Well, it means it has a horizontal tangent line there, right? The first derivative tells you the slope of the tangent line. And if that's equal to 0, that means that the slope of the tangent line is 0, so it's horizontal. Um, and that's what we can say about the graph. It's got a horizontal tangent line there. Okay. So now let's look at um, when a function is not differentiable, right? When can you not take the derivative? Um, so there's a few uh, examples of that that we'll look at. Uh, so what, the way we'll phrase this is I'll just give you these scenarios where f is not differentiable, basically by what the graph looks like. So x is not differentiable at x equals a if there's a discontinuity at a. So if you're not continuous at the x value, you can't be differentiable there. So that would be something like this. If you have a hole uh, at that x value a, then you're not continuous, and so you cannot be differentiable there. It's also not continuous if there's a corner. Right? So if you have a corner uh, at, on your graph, then uh, you're not continuous there. And one way to think about that is, well, what would your tangent line be? You'd have a lot of options, right? If you were not continuous where we had that hole, you couldn't hit the graph at that point because there was no graph to hit. When you have a corner, the function is defined there, right? That uh, there is f of a, it does exist, but the tangent line could be anything. You can hit just that point in a lot of ways. Um, uh, and uh, anyway, uh, if you have a corner, you're not differentiable. You're also not differentiable if you have a vertical tangent line. So a vertical tangent line would mean that uh, the slope of that line is non-existent, right? It's an infinite slope. And so if the first derivative gives, gives us the slope of the tangent line, then if you have a vertical tangent line, that first derivative should not exist. It should be infinite kind of thing. Uh, and that is, in fact, true. And so if you have a vertical tangent line, and that can happen at a cusp, like we have on the left, um, or uh, like the graph on the right, where you just are sort of uh, going up, and then you have a point, one point in there that's got a vertical tangent line. Um, and that would... Uh, be another example of where a function is not differentiable. Now let's look at marginal change. So here we have Tucker has her own line of luxury cat collars. Her profit is given by this function p of x, where x is the number of collars that she sells. It says if she has already sold 10 collars, how much will her profit change if she sells one more collar? Right, so this uh, is something we can calculate, so let's calculate that. So if she's already sold 10, what, what is her profit right now? Well, that would be uh, 100 squared minus 15 is 85. And if she sells one more, then she'll be selling 11 collars. And 11 squared minus 15 is what? Well, that's 121 minus 15, which would be 106. Okay, so sticking with this same example of Tucker's uh, selling these luxury cat collars. So what, what this marginal change business, right, that's my title of the slide, what that is, is that's where you can approximate the change of the function. So we can approximate the increase in the profit using the derivative. So if the sales increase by one, oops, this says his, that should say her. That was back when I thought Tucker was still a boy. Uh, if Tucker increases her sales by one from 10 to 11, you can approximate the increase in the profit by finding p prime of 10. 
So we know the exact change we calculated to be 21. So let's see if our this approximation is close to that. So what's p prime of x? Uh, so x squared minus 15, you'll get 2x for the derivative. And then plug in 10, right? That's our original where, where we already had sold 10 and when we want to approximate the increase in the sales by increasing this, the number of things sold by one. So from 10 to 11, so we're gonna plug in 10 and that's 20. And so here we're saying the the profit will change by approximately 20. We found that it changed by exactly 21, but 20 is a decent approximate, right? Um, and uh, that's that's what we'll be doing, right? So we'll have problems that say, use the derivative to approximate the increase in the profit, things like that. And what we'll do with that is you take the derivative and plug in your original amount. In this case, it was 10. And that'll give you the approximate change. Uh, if it's a positive number here, like we got positive 20, that'll be an increase. And if you get a negative number, that'll be a decrease. But that, it, that gives you the approximate change of the function. We call that the marginal change. So uh, we know from that example we had that um, the marginal change p prime of x over here that's what it is it approximates that's what this squiggly squiggly line means uh, that was approximating the difference uh, the exact difference in the profit from adding one more thing and you can similarly define marginal change of any function to just be the derivative of that function right so if you're talking about revenue. The marginal revenue would be the derivative of the revenue. If you're talking about cost, the marginal cost would be the derivative of the cost. If you're talking about some random function n of x, then the marginal change of that function would be n prime. Right? So the marginal change is always just the derivative. Uh, and just as a note, the closer that that function is to a straight line, the better that approximation will be. If it's very curved, if it's not very straight, that approximation might not be so great. Um, uh, but that's just a side note. So now let's look at an example. It says, when Sully is eating dinner, the volume in liters of his stomach can be given by this function V of T. It's going to spit out the volume in liters of his stomach, where T is the time in minutes since he started eating. So to approximate how much his stomach will grow in the next minute if he's already been eating for three minutes. So we're talking about approximating the growth of his stomach, so finding how the volume is changing. So we're looking at how this function is changing in the next minute, if he's already been eating for three minutes. So we want to approximate V of four, right? That would be the next minute minus V of three. So this would be the exact change in the size of his stomach, right? So if he's already been eating for three minutes and the difference between that and the next minute would be the difference between V of four and V of three. And we can approximate that by taking the derivative and plugging in what he's already been eating for, which is three minutes. So we're going to use that derivative to approximate this. So let's take the derivative. Well, what's the derivative? Looks like you'll get, um, so you have 0.5t squared, multiply 0.5 by 2 to get 0.1t plus 1. Well, when you take the derivative, it would go away. So it's just 0.1t. So now we want v prime of 3. Well, that would be 0.3. So there you go. His stomach will increase by approximately 0.3 liters from minute 3 to minute 4 after he started eating. All right, that's the end of 2.1.